Okay. All right. So now we are letting folks in and get started here. Um, welcome everyone to this installment of the California Fire Science Seminar Series. I'm Crystal Colden at the University of California Merced. Uh, I co-host and co-organize this seminar series uh, with my colleagues, Dr. Michael Gallner at University of California Berkeley and Dr. Jeanette Cobiana Miquez at University of California Merced. We're delighted that you could join us again this week uh, for our speaker, Dr. Kevin Bladen uh, from Oregon State University. Uh, before we get started here, a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you've been joining us weekly, uh, you know that this webinar uh, does not allow you to be seen or heard uh, by the speaker or the panelists and that we encourage questions, but please enter them into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen on the toolbar. Uh, there's a little icon that says Q&A with a couple of question bubbles. Uh, that is the place to put your questions. Um, if you forget and put them in the chat, we'll ask you just to move them over to the Q&A. Uh, and there will be a little bit of time for questions at the end. But then, of course, we also have our uh, post-webinar discussion Zoom. That will actually be in a different location, um, which was in the email that was sent out as a reminder for this. Um, and I will also post that link in the chat as we get towards uh, the end of the hour here. And there's an opportunity to engage more one-on-one -on -one and ask additional questions of Dr. Bladen there. Um, and several folks have asked over uh, the last several weeks, uh, where are these recorded Zooms um, being posted at? We have a YouTube page. The link for the YouTube page is on our website. Um, and that, and uh, Franz has actually just also posted the YouTube link uh, in the chat window. So if you missed a week, um, you're dying to go back and watch it. There's been some, I, I think almost every talk we've had this year has been just amazing. So please feel free to, to go back and watch those past talks on our YouTube page. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Uh, we're very excited to have of uh, Dr. Kevin Bladen, uh, who's an Associate Professor of Forest Ecohydrology and Watershed Science at Oregon State University. Uh, and he's in the Engineering Resources and uh, Forest Engineering Resources and Management Department. There we go. Uh, his research focuses on understanding the range of effects from wildfires and post-fire forest management activities on hydrology, water quality, aquatic ecosystem health, and death downstream community drinking water supplies. We've had a lot of requests this year for uh, specialty expertise in hydrology and, and water quality. So we're absolutely delighted to host Dr. Bladen today. Uh, and with that, Kevin, I'll let you take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Crystal. It's um, a, a, an absolute pleasure to be here. I, I thank you for uh, the invitation and, and the opportunity. Um, as Crystal mentioned, uh, my, my um, area of expertise is uh, on uh, wildfire, post-wildfire effects on a range of, of water values and is something that um, has really been my passion for about the last uh, 17 years. And um, it's interesting to see the evolution of that and the, the groups and the numbers of folks who have um, increasingly become interested in something that's been um, near and dear to to me and and some close colleagues for a, a number of years, and so the in the the time that I have with you today, uh, what I've put together in my plan is to sort of walk you through at a, a range of different levels uh, the types of things that we might expect to see after some of the wildfires that we've observed in in the past couple of years uh, in the West. I think mo most of you in in this audience are going to be interested in in California. But certainly, uh, the, this past year gave us some really unique situation in in Oregon, uh, and there are some other other fires up in in Washington State and and elsewhere that that I'll talk about today. So, um, let me get this to go forward. Um, obviously, I think most most folks uh, who are here today know the current situation. Uh, but just for a bit of prefatory material and and sort of to to, to ground us. 
I uh, thought I'd show some of, of these uh, initial slides on the, the current wildfire regime. And it's really led to an increase in interest in a, a large number of areas in terms, in, in additionally, hydrology. And a lot of concerns around hydrology and the effects on water quantity and quality, which can be uh, quite substantial and long lasting as, as we'll illustrate today. And so uh, this figure, I think many are familiar with you know, sort of the, over the last 60 years, uh, this is the annual area burned in the contiguous US. Uh, the red line shows the uh, five year rolling average for area burned. And we can see looking at that trend, this, this decreasing trend in area burn from the 60s to about the, the mid to late 1990s. And then the, that dramatic uptick in, in has really remained um, elevated over the last couple of decades. And if we pull out and tease out the top 10 years of record uh, in terms of area burned in the contiguous US, we see that those all fall out it, since um, the year 2000, uh, with our most recent year being the, the largest area burned in the contiguous US. And, and the average of those 10 years is a, approximately double the long-term average of which they are a part of. And so a really substantial shift in the wildfire regime in, in, the, in the past several years relative to that 1960 to 1990s um, period. So with that, we've also seen uh, some really dramatic shifts in the costs uh, associated with suppressing those fires. Uh, this uh, a figure showing you from the mid 1980s to the most recent year, the annual cost by the US Forest Service in millions of dollars to uh, suppress uh, those wildfires. And so from the, about the mid 80s to 2010, we spent on average of about $800 million per year. And you can see from this figure, about three of the last four years, we've exceeded $3 billion in expenditure just for fire suppression. And so I think I'm, I'm fairly certain that those numbers and, and, and this information is something that most of you are familiar with and comfortable with. And it's this number associated with the fire suppression that's quite often reported um, in uh, the mainstream media and the news. And because of that, I think there's many who have this perception now. Here we are at this time of year, we, we, in a lot of places, unfortunately the fire season's kicked up again in California. Uh, and we're, we're probably not too far behind. It's been an incredibly dry year here in, in Oregon. But regardless, I think, you know, that perception of the threat and the impacts from fire have dwindled from a lot of folks' mind. And with that, there's a lack of perception of the long-term costs associated with those wildfires. But natural resource economists who've put some dollars and cents to this to try to understand what do those long-term post-fire effects look like in terms of cost have estimated in the Western US that those are anywhere between two to 30 times greater than the suppression costs alone. That is enormous. And those, those, the, the, those dollars that, that go into these true costs are attributed to things like loss of the natural resource base, loss of recreational uh, value, um, and uh, long-term impacts on water supply, which is what we'll, we'll talk about for the, the most part today. And so when we're thinking about uh, the situation here in, in uh, the West, uh, well, I, I stole this slide because, it, because we've been talking a lot about um, my home state in, in the, the last uh, several months. But here in Oregon, this, this uh, fire year was really substantial and unique for this state. Uh, looking at um, these orange polygons, 1984 to 2018, the, these are all the fires that have burned in Oregon. The five largest fires to have burned in this state are the uh, the pink polygons here. And we, this state in this past year, I, I know it's dwarfed in California. I think it was about four, four plus million acres in California burned, but for Oregon to have 1.1 million acres burned and burn in the way that they did and in the location they did uh, is really raised um, a lot of folks eyebrows in, in this state. And, and our expectation is 
that a lot of the long-term effects are going to be tied to the impacts on water. And you can see the location of these uh, uh, fire polygons relative to some of our largest communities in Salem and Eugene, uh, our, our state capital. And, and a photo off to the right here is a, um, an individual from the city of Eugene. I've been working with several of the, the cities who are, are very concerned about the, the impacts of these fires on their, their source water supply. And I think you probably read this last, this bullet down here. Uh, we had 23 utilities, some burned right to the ground and others are currently dealing with the, the impacts of uh, the, the change in water quality. We've had some that have actually had to shut down their intakes altogether and just rely on the water that they've already treated uh, and hope that the change in water quality passes um, and they're able to, to get back online. And so we've already seen that despite a very dry year. And in some sense, we may have, may have avoided some things with that dry year. And so, um, you know, I know you folks uh, are probably much more familiar with this, this map and, and the polygons uh, uh, associated with the large fires that burned in, in California. But my expectation would be there would be very similar things in terms of the impacts because of the location of many of those fires in our source water regions relative to the communities that are very heavily reliant upon um, those water supplies. Or you know, we're thinking about aquatic ecology. There's some really dramatic and long-term changes in aquatic ecology that, that can occur with fire in, in some of these uh, um, areas, mountainous areas in the Sierra Nevada, perhaps um, um, after the wildfire. So starting to get into some of the things now uh, that, that we've done and the, and the research and the insights with, that we've been able to glean uh, in terms of effects that we might expect. This is starting at a very high course level. Uh, some colleagues and I a number of years ago undertook a global analysis where we put together a number of different uh, layers, uh, uh, data layers that we had available at a global scale. I think, um, as you well know, we're fairly limited in what we can look at at a global scale, but um, whatever layers we had available, we put those together in a way that would try to provide some insights into what parts of the, the, the planet are most at risk from wildfire negatively impacting their water supply. And if we just zoom in in the Western US here and take sort of an average of the polygons from the, the three Western states, uh, we come out somewhere in that upper 30th to 35th percentile. And that's a little bit surprising to us, but um, it, we're, we're in terms of globally to be in that upper 30th to 35th percentile of places on the planet that are at risk of our water supplies being negatively impacted and impacting um, human water needs um, is, is really substantial and something to, to pay attention to. So not only is that a mo model, this is mo that was modeling research. Uh, we've also undertaken some um, empirical research. Uh, these, this is some, some maps of, of a study we undertook looking at, I believe it was about 160, 150 to 160 wildfires in the contiguous US where we had five years of pre-fire data five years of post-fire data on stream flow. And of course, that included a range of different fire sizes and severities and um, different catchment characteristics. And what we were hoping to do was try to lend some insights in what are the, some of the drivers behind the stream flow response that, that we might observe um, in these watersheds. And um, what we found was catchment burned, uh, the area burned was the, the number one um, um, driver of a stream flow response and that there happened to be a, a threshold there where if we crossed about 20% of the area burned of the watershed, that's when we would see a demonstrable change in stream flow. That's really messy. As you know, it's, pro it's probably tied up very much in burn severity, which happened to be our um, second metric that really popped out as, as a driver of, of the stream flow response. And, and secondarily, the, the, another thing that came out from this is that we really saw no change in flow after any of the prescribed fires that were in our 
um, a group that, that we looked at and really speaks to the, the potential value of prescribed fire as a tool uh, in the toolbox. You know, it, we can't equate wildfire to prescribed fire when it comes to water in, in any way. They're ve very, very different um, types of impacts. And so it's you know, something to, to keep in mind. Um, one of the other pieces that came out of this, not only burn severity and area burn were the main factors, but really it was, it was this as well. And that post-fire precipitation, the year uh, two, three, four, five after the fire, really depending on what we got for an input of precipitation would really influence the response that, that we would observe. And that is, unfortunately is something that's very much um, out of our control, but certainly something to, to um, keep in mind. So, uh, well, you know, post-fire precip is going to impact that stream flow response. It can also impact the longevity of effects is something else we found as it can impact site recovery. Um, this is some research results uh, that we're currently working up. It was led by a master's student, Andy Wilson and um, Ann Nolan at the University of Nevada, Reno, and, and fortunate to, to be able to uh, work with them on, on this piece of work. And, and um, what Andy undertook as part of his, his thesis work was to look at these large fires that burn in the Washington Cascades um, over in, in Western Montana Rockies, um, down in the Oregon Cascades, and then um, over in central Idaho. And so we got these um, four different um, subregions in the Columbia River Basin. And he was also looking at the different forest types that dominated um, some of these areas. So Douglas fir, Engelman spruce, subalpine fir, uh, we got white bark pine and, and mountain hemlock here are some of the forest types. And what he was looking at was the change over time in pre and post fire forest greenness. And so part of that post fire and whittling down what fires he looked at, he wanted at least two years of pre fire data and then at least three years of post fire data. And by greenness, what he was using was this enhanced vegetation index or EVI, which is a, a modus product. And then he tried to relate that change in greenness over time to a number of characteristics that we thought might be important drivers of that recovery. And so all these different colors here in these, uh, in the, these really colorful plots are, are some of those main um, drivers that popped out. And if we focus on this pink and the purple and these blues here, these are uh, essentially precipitation factors. It's either one year post-fire precipitation, the three year post-fire precipitation, or the blues are the snow cover, one year um, post-fire snow cover or three year post-fire snow cover. And so if we look across all of these regions and all of the forest types, that, that precipitation piece really accounts for 40 to about 98% of the, the uh, vegetation recovery that we could account for um, in that, that greenness metric that, that he was using. And it's really that second variable, that snow cover, that's an interesting one in a, a consideration is we have climate change and, and if we have decreasing persistence of snow packs or weakening snow packs in those post-fire years, it can really lead to delays in vegetation recovery and um, related to that delays in, in hydrologic recovery. So uh, that's something we, I, I've been asked a lot about uh, since these fires have happened is, well, how, okay, if we see these changes in flow, um, how long might they last? And so colleagues and I are uh, currently just finishing up a review where we've isolated and looked at uh, research that could lend some insights into that from just Mediterranean climates, uh, looking at those that have that seasonally wet, seasonally dry climate. And what this figure is showing you just on the y-axis are the various studies we were able to find that can provide insights into recovery. And on the x-axis is the post-fire year that the, the study included. Uh, the red colors are studies that were not recovered the black are those where there was some indication of hydrologic recovery. 
And what we, what we found, surprisingly, we well, first of all, we only found 30 studies, so very fairly limited information on recovery. And of those, um, over half of those studies, there was no indication of hydrologic recovery at least five years after the fire. We don't know how long that pushes out for as uh, most of these studies uh, end um, at the time of publication and there isn't any further data. And you know that's the, the problem in our, our research funding cycle is it, it often is, is very short. And so our information that we have about long-term effects on hydrology is, is really uncertain. We're really fortunate and, and uh, to have this, this next study that um, I was able to participate up in, in Washington state. Uh, this was the site of the Antiat fire. And if you're, you're not familiar with this uh, fire, this study was set up in the 1960s through the 1970s. It was a paired watershed study. They had three watersheds. And the, the objectives of the study were actually to look at the effects of the current forest harvesting or forest management practices at the time. They set this up in the 60s through the 70s. And this, the, what you're seeing here, these lines uh, through, that run through the 60s and 70s, this was the calibration period. They were trying to develop a relationship between the watersheds in terms of runoff ratio or just the proportion of the precipitation that ends up as stream flow. The year that they were going to go in and harvest these sites, the Andiat fire occurred and burned all of these watersheds. This thing then shifted to a post-fire study and uh, they, they studied for seven years the effects. And you can see these lines all shifting up. We saw anywhere between um, two to four fold increases in the amount of water in the streams, increases in annual water yields, increases in peak flows, increases in the uh, summer low flows. The important part of this though, the orange line here, okay, so let's focus just on the orange line, this Fox Creek watershed. This one watershed was left to recover on its own. The green watershed and the purple watershed, Burns and McCree, these two watersheds were salvage logged. At the time, they were aerially seeded, not something we do a lot of um, anymore, but they were aerially seeded and fertilized. In the short term, that first seven year after, the largest jump up and the biggest change in peak flows, the biggest change in increase in annual water yields was in those watersheds that were salvage logged, probably what you would expect. However, what gets really cool about this study is we were able to go back 35 to 40 years after the fire, reestablish the gauging sites and, and project this out from in, in the early 2000s. And what we found was the, the green and the purple here, Burns and McCree, the two salvage log watersheds, they had recovered, the ones that were salvage log. And the one that was left to recover on its own, there was still evidence of elevated stream flow um, 35 to, to 40 years af after the fire. And so it really speaks to, um, you know, sort of thinking about trade-offs in terms of short-term versus long-term impacts. And, and certainly in a discussion and questions, we could, we could talk about those trade-offs and really, is this a good or a bad thing? And, and I don't think you could pigeonhole that in any way, but I think it's, it's useful information to sort of think about uh, long-term and, and short-term effects and some of the trade-offs we might need to make. Okay, so um, more water in the streams, they often get, well, why does that happen? Obviously we're removing the trees and we're removing that evapotranspiration piece, the, the water use by the trees, but there's also some really profound changes that happen obviously to the, um, the soil structure, the soil hydraulic properties to change how, how water is routed to streams. Um, and this is a, a figure showing some data um, from a, a fire in, in California, Northern California, um, the Valley Fire, and on the, the x-axis is what's called hydraulic conductivity. It's just the ease with which water can move through the soil if it's able to enter the soil. And in this case, what we found was um, one to two orders of magnitude increase in 
that flow of water through soils if it was able to enter the soils. However, what's really interesting is when we also compare it with what's on the y-axis. This variable is called sorptivity. Essentially, you could think of it as the ease with which water can be pulled in due to uh, matrix forces, pulled into the soil, and actually enter the soil. And in this case, what we found was that actually we had uh, one to two orders of magnitude decreases in sorptivity in those high burn severity soils. That the, the, the water, when you have rain events, is less likely to enter the soil, is more likely to flow over the surface of the soil. Um, if it's able to enter, it's going to then move very rapidly down through, through the soil to the groundwater or run off through that soil laterally and into streams. Okay, so you got a couple things happening there. I know many of you maybe have heard about and thought about and talked about um, soil water repellency or hydrophobicity. And certainly that plays a role, but there are other factors at play here uh, when, um, in terms of the changes in the soil structural properties that lead to um, overland flow or really rapid runoff. Um, this is uh, yet another study to, to illustrate some of that. This one from um, Tennessee. And I, I haven't talked about this in a while, but I, in thinking about today, I, I threw this in here because I think this is a really unique study. You know, we get really focused in, in our research in, in the West there because of all of the, the wildfire that's, that's in our face all the time. Um, this was a, a really unique opportunity and um, I don't know if we'll ever do something like this again, but really cool to actually go to a location and um, look at a fire in a completely different light. This, this was in, in uh, Tennessee, like I said, really deciduous dominated fire or, or uh, watersheds. And the reason we went there, this happened to be a neon site that burned. And so we had a lot of opportunity with pre-fire data uh, to um, get a better understanding of how does fire actually change certain metrics. And, and part of this was focused on pyrogenic organic matter that, that I won't talk about. But um, in terms of the water and, and, and water content, we put together some, um, some, some curves here uh, with volumetric water content on the y-axis uh, matrix potential on, on the, the y-axis or how tightly bound that, that water is in, in the soil. And what we found from this is that the, the water in these low severity burn sites tends to be much more tightly bound at higher water contents, whereas it, it drains more rapidly and isn't held as tightly in the moderate severity sites. Where this becomes important is thinking about recovery and water availability for recovering vegetation, whereas we increase the severity, those changes in the structural properties of the soil don't allow the soil to hold the water and so it's going to drain. And will th that sort of thing can really contribute to that delayed uh, vegetative recovery that, that we often observe after high severity fires. Okay, other things. Obviously that we're concerned about after fires, if we've got more runoff and more water in the streams is what happens with water quality. Uh, this is some, some uh, research uh, from colleagues in, in Colorado who put together um, some estimates across the contiguous US of areas that are, are likely to burn and where they had data and information for them. So there are, there are some, some black holes in here that, that we could uh, perhaps fill in in future years, but um, there are some areas that you folks are, are probably interested in. And what we tend to see in the West are um, some of the, the higher um, post-fire erosion rates. Uh, so these aren't just erosion rates, but they are actually post-fire erosion rates. And so it has to do with um, you know, likelihood of large high severity wildfires, but then that coming together with steep slopes, um, you know, um, seasonally wet climates and then the local geology and erodibility. And so what that means, you know, sort of thinking about um, these areas is going to be more sediment in our streams, obviously with greater erosion. Uh, this is some uh, study results from a location in the, the Rocky Mountains that has similar erodibility as a lot of those locations in, in the West that we're interested about. And 
what it's showing here is a decade of data. The green uh, bars are reference or unburned watersheds. The black bars are burned watersheds and the orange bars are burned and salvaged log watersheds. And so on the y-axis is sediment concentrations in the streams of each of these um, um, watershed types. And in this case, what we observed across a decade is about four to 20 times greater sediment concentrations in our burn streams than in our unburned streams. And in this case, salvage logging actually made things worse. You can see anywhere between five to 37 times more sediment in those burned and salvage log streams um, relative to the reference streams. And so that's a, a really substantial shift up in the sediment mobility and delivery to these streams um, and, and very long lasting that's fairly, fairly well exacerbated by salvage logging. And to some, that's often how they, they, they think about, about salvage logging and its impacts. However, it's really important to juxtapose that study with, with this one. This is from uh, the 2015 Valley Fire, uh, just northwest of, of Sacramento. And what we did there, we uh, established some, some sediment fences on, on different hill slopes and really tried to capture and characterize the, the runoff and, and sediment mobility off of these different hill slopes towards the streams. And so you're seeing here, again, the fire was in 2015. We set up in 2016. Then uh, in 2017, sites were salvage logged and also subsoil. This isn't really a common thing, but something that um, our, our collaborators at the Forest Service and CAL FIRE wanted to look at was after we salvage, if we take that extra step to run a piece of heavy equipment across the landscape to cut furrows into the landscape, does that help or does that make things worse in any way? Um, and so in this case, what we saw really surprisingly to us is that our highest sediment yields were coming off of the burned sites, that we had reduced sediment yields coming off of the salvage log and the subsoiled sites. And really what we were able to relate this to was all of the woody material that was left on the ground. And often we, we're gonna come in and remove a lot of this out of concerns that it creates opportunities for future fires. But in this case, leaving that on the ground, we were really able to illustrate that depending on how we approach this salvage logging, we, we could reduce um, erosion and, and sediment movement off of those hill slopes. And so again, something to think about in, in terms of trade-offs. Now related to that, you know, we've got sediment uh, moving off of these hill slopes in different ways. Uh, that actually, um, what, what we showed or what we, we quantified is that that can actually influence um, the soil fertility or the nutrients in the soil. And so what you're looking at here again, those burned salvage log subsoil sites, this is the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the upper five centimeters of soil, five to 10 centimeters of soil, and then that which, which we, we collected um, off of these, that was moving off of these hill slopes in these, these sediment fences. And in all of these, statistically, we saw um, elevated carbon to nitrogen ratios um, in the, the salvage log and, and subsoiled sites, which, which is really quite interesting. And so what that has led to, that increase in, in carbon to nitrogen ratios, it, it appears as though it might be contributing to less availability of nitrogen and slowing of the, the, the vegetation recovery. We've got really dramatic declines in vegetation biomass, about two and a half times more vegetation biomass in just the burned alone sites, and about six times more it, when we compare the subsoil to the, the, the burned alone sites. And so that additional disturbance somehow in, in some way appears maybe to have influenced the, the availability of nutrients and um, now interacted with the, the vegetation recovery and, and biomass. Okay, so other things that, that I get asked about and, and think about and um, I'm, I'm interested in are, um, scaling scaling issues and so okay great if you see these effects in our headwaters 
Do they actually move long distances downstream and do they actually impact our communities? Um, this is one study that lends some insights into that. Um, this, this figure on the, the, the left here is gray, is the burned area. And then these little red dots are locations that we installed these little Phillips samplers into the stream. And if you're unfamiliar with Phillips sampler, it kind of looked like a giant crayon. They've got on the front this little opening and that opening allows both water and um, fine sediment. Uh, suspended sediment less than 0.63 micrometers to enter into the front and there's a little hole in the back that allows water to go out the back and the sediment settles out inside of this. So this is a passive sampler that we put in the stream for a period of time. We come back, we collect that, and then you look at the chemistry of that sediment. Do some really detailed chemistry and then you relate that to locations in the watershed where you've also taken samples. So we took samples from the burn and from the unburned areas. And from that, we were able to illustrate that in this reservoir downstream, you're about 50 miles downstream, that the majority, the vast majority, 80% of the sediment that was ending up in this reservoir was coming from this very small portion of the landscape that was burned. Okay, so um, we know obviously that fires can create erosion and also with this type of research we know that the once in the system that the that sediment can propagate and travel um, long distances downstream and hit utilities and intakes um, many years later and and create some challenges for them and so that's something that as part of this that, that i'm interested in and in, in working with colleagues who who um, are drinking water treatment engineers and so um, for those of you that aren't familiar with treatment, um, what I'm just showing here is a, a table that's got some different treatment processes, the classic conventional drinking water treatment process um, down to some of these other processes, filtration um, um, type plants. And each of these are designed to deal with different types of, of water quality that a conventional treatment plant is really robust um, against changes in water quality in terms of turbidity or organic carbon, where some of these other newer technologies may be less robust. And so we have a lot of areas that um, here in Oregon where, well, we, our forests provide this really great, clean, clear water. And so our communities are left a little vulnerable that they haven't invested in um, more robust treatment processes. And, and therefore, if we get these dramatic changes in things like carbon and turbidity, it can create some, some um, substantial and long-term challenges for them and some substantial costs for them that then get passed on to taxpayers and, and potentially for, for decades. And so this is just some preliminary data that we've gotten from one of the large wildfires in Oregon, the Holiday Farm Fire in the McKenzie River Basin, which feeds the, the city of Eugene, and, and just sort of plotting that, that turbidity data. And so despite having a very dry year, we've been set up waiting for storms and trying to capture storms, and it really haven't happened. We've ca caught one or two storms. Um, and that's in some ways um, we, we've, we've dodged a bullet, but even still, despite that, we've had about 2% of the days uh, where the, that turbidity value has exceeded some, some level where if we didn't have a conventional treatment plant, we, we would be challenged to, to provide drinking, safe drinking water. Um, and, and similarly, you know, I, I plotted down here this at the other end of the spectrum, this inline filtration. If our communities had something like this that they were reliant upon, about 17% of the days thus far, we've had turbidity levels that, that have created challenges for them. Okay, so along with sediment, um, we're all always interested in, in some of the limiting nutrients that might come along for, for the ride. This is uh, some results from that, that study that I showed you previously uh, for, for sediment concentrations from the east slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And what we've observed there are long-term changes in, in phosphorus. And in, for the most part after fires, a lot of that phosphorus tends to be orthophosphate, which is bound to the face of of sediment. And so if we have sediment and erosion, 
we may have elevated phosphorus. Um, in terms of nitrogen, um, often after fires, what we're left with is, is mostly nitrate. There's a bit of ammonium, but mostly nitrate, which is much more mobile. And so as a result, the majority of studies have only seen you know, changes in nitrogen sort of two, three years after fire before returning back to some, some baseline, baseline level. So again, that, I, this was put together, this slide was put together before for an audience interested, the Holiday Farm Fire this year um, up in Oregon, we've been very surprised at some of our phosphorus levels that, that we've observed. You can see up to 1,460 micrograms per liter, not something we, we had expected in these sites and will be interesting to, to follow out over the, the next number of years. Now, so I wanted to show this study. Uh, this is from Chuck Rhodes and colleagues in, in Colorado uh, the, after the Hayman fire. This is an important one because, uh, you know, as I mentioned nitrogen and mentioned the really rapid recovery that we see in a lot of studies, this is not always the case, as Chuck illustrated in, in the Hayman, um, following out 14 to 15 years after, he, he, he was able to quantify and observe strongly elevated nitrate and total dissolved nitrogen in those burned watersheds, you know, the, um, um, a decade and a half after, after the fire. And interestingly, what they uh, were able to attribute that to is again, recovery. So NDVI, I think many are familiar with, uh, again, a type of greenness index um, in the riparian area. And you can see after the fire, this really drops off and then over the, the period of study, fairly slow recovery in that these burned watersheds relative to their unburned watersheds. And that slow vegetation recovery has really delayed um, the recovery in the nitrogen signal. And so, well, the, again, this comes to our decisions matter on all of these things after the fire and, and things to, to think about in terms of those trade-offs. Okay, and I, I always have to show this from, from uh, my work with my colleagues up, up in, in, uh, in Canada in um, linking the dots uh, when we see increases in, in erosion and sediment and nitrogen and phosphorus limiting nutrients that can have very profound impacts on our aquatic ecosystems. And so these are photos here in the bottom of our unburned systems and really those unburned systems are headwater streams, they're, they're truly oligotrophic where you, you pick up rocks and there's not a lot growing in those systems and there's not a lot of sediment in them. But here we are six years after the fire, real proliferation of algal productivity um, associated with that continued influx of, of, of phosphorus as well as that initial influx of, of nitrogen in the system. And then that can continue to trickle down and impact our ecosystems in multiple different ways. Um, this is uh, invertebrate abundances where we saw sort of one and a half to uh, threefold increases in the, the abundances and masses of, of invertebrates and shifts in community structure. Uh, this is a, a classic um, aquatic ecology um, metric that's used, EPT, just ephemeroptera, plecoptera, trichoptera, so mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, looking at the counts of those in relation to um, diptera or true flies. And you can see anywhere from eight to 16 fold higher EPT to D ratios in those reference watersheds, really driven by an influx of trophic generalists, the, the diptera here. You know, these critters here, the EPT, really prefer clean water and to our, to our surprise, they didn't really drop out of the system. They were just overwhelmed by the, the influx of, of diptera. With that, though, you might think, well, OK, this isn't great in terms of the impacts. But uh, as the next step in this, what we did is we captured and quantified fish and aged those fish looking just at their otolith. And, and just isolated those fish that had spent their entire life history um, in the burn or had, had lived after the burn. So we tried to limit it to, um, to that time frame. And what we found were the, those fish tended to be um, larger and, and longer fish in, in the burn system. And that 
there happened to be um, additional and more food available uh, for them. And, and that finding is really consistent with uh, colleagues' work, Becky Flickcroft up in the Wenatchee um, Reservoir or, or Wenatchee Basin in, um, in Washington State. Uh, this is the, the first um, watershed here is pre-fire, this is post-fire, and then this is just a change. And in this change watershed, the red is, is decrease, gray, no change, and the blue where we see an increase in habitat quality. And for the most part, the fire has led to either no change or an increase. There's certainly areas where we've seen a decrease in habitat, but, but really led to actually a positive outcome um, in terms of habitat for fish. So uh, just to wrap this up then, sort of what, what we might expect here in, in Oregon, what we might expect in California, there's still a lot of uncertainty. You folks um, fortunately have much more data and much more information than we do. I still, what, I still think this applies. I still think there's a lot of uncertainty about that response. There's still a dearth of information um, on these topics. Um, that, that we've talked about today. It's far worse here in Oregon. You, know, you go web of science and, and do a search for fire and water in Oregon. We have six studies grand total. Um, that will change in, in the coming years. But um, it, to be honest, you're not too far off in, in California. And I, I think it's an area we need to uh, continue to invest in and, and continue to, to um, undertake research. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and looks like we have a few questions in the Q&A. We have about 10 okay. minutes here. Um, and so if, if folks have questions, please do add them to the, the Q&A um, and we'll hopefully be able to get through them here. Uh, so the first question uh, comes from Annie Leverich, who's asking, uh, it seems like the acres burned per year graph shows that following a year with more acres burned is a year with significantly less acres burned and vice versa. What are some mm. of the reasons for that? Uh, do you know the answer to that? I don't know the answer. I think you know, certainly <laughs> I, I, I'm not a wildfire scientist, so I, I don't know the exact <laughs> reasons for that. Um, if I were to, I were to posit a guess, you know, certainly, um, it, to me, it would would be tied to sort of that climatic signal. And while certainly we we often have very dry years following each other, uh, my my guess would be just that it there's probably some some strong relationship with climate and and area burned. Um, there's also probably some st stochastic component in that in terms of starts and 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 human starts and lightning starts and um, so uh, yeah sorry I'm, I'm not a wildfire scientist so <laughs> you, you've, you've got me into it's on the I almost, icy I almost shit felt that ground right off the way. bat <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's a good question Annie and it, it's uh uh uh, and we, we sort of put Kevin on the spot by asking that because um, it's really if anybody can actually predict the area burned every year, um, they would be making a lot more money than any of us. So <laughs> it, it's yeah. uh, interannual interannual variability and the stochasticity yeah. of meteorology that is completely unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and it's not true every year. I mean, there's there's certainly years where you get several big years in a row and some quiet years in a row, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, the John John, um, John, and, and um, Anthony Westerling type folks are the, I think the, the folks who can sort of answer those types of questions. I would I, and they'll still tell you they, uh, they, <laughs> they, they, they can't predict it either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, tough, I'm sure. Looking back and understanding why is much easier than trying to project forward. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so this this is your yeah. chance to ask a lot of great hydrology focused questions and water yeah. quality water quality focused questions for Kevin because he is our to, expert here today. <laughs> you know, to be on, to be honest, we could probably inject that same answer that we just gave to a lot of the hydrology questions. Is that yeah. the, we, we, it's so difficult to understand and predict? I, I hope that folks caught this whole idea of variability and differential responses. It's it's so challenging. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's because we've been trying to manage water supply a heck of a lot longer 
in California than we've been trying to manage uh, wildfires across huge landscapes. And um, man, we're not very good at that either. It's the uh, hit or miss of yeah. <laughs> trying to predict trying to predict your, this year's snowpack. Um, so we have a question from Anya who asks, uh, what, <laughs> do you know who this one's coming from? Uh, what, cause, what causes the increase in the C to N ratio? Uh, is it the additional carbon from bird material or would nitrogen amendment or planting legumes help reduce that impact on regrowth? Uh, yeah, great, uh, great question. Yes, I, I, I think it's the, that, that increase in C to N um, it is from that just that initial influx in um, the the carbon with the bitter bitter re, bitter regrowth, uh, but uh, the, the the microbes really uh, our sense is from some of the detailed work I got, that colleagues are working on that the microbes in those sites really start to rapidly take up the the nitrogen that the whole story it, at least on our sites at the Valley Fire we're really tied to the, the nitrogen piece and how, how much of the, the microbes remain and are on site associated with those different disturbances. The thought might be that this is one of the working hypotheses we had was that additional disturbance, the, the salvage logging, the subsoiling where we run heavy equipment across that sort of break up some of those water repellent layers if they exist or break up or change that soil structure can help the, the microbial communities. But in doing so, the, those microbial communities really rapidly start to take up a lot of that nitrogen, uh, more so than in the burned alone, and, and, and shift those ratios that we've got more carbon to uh, available and much less nitrogen, and, and may then delay some of the, the recovery. I will note that uh, Park Williams joined us today. Um, and some of you may remember mm -hmm. that uh, Park gave that great talk on uh, climate and wildfire relationships uh, in the uh, first part of the semester. And, and he's put in a note here about um, the, the cycles uh, that they've found in this sort of interannual variability in, in uh, fire area burns. So, oh, cool. um, and it looks like a link to a, a paper, I guess. Um, so that's, uh, thanks Park for, for adding, you're, <laughs> you're, you're yeah. one of the chief experts in this area, so. <laughs> that's great. Um, so we have a question from Jason Wells. Uh, what kinds of slash treatments were done in the Valley Fire area? Was the slash broadcast evenly across the landscape or was it contoured or piled in some way? Was there an effort to quantify changes in uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in areas that were directly skidded versus less impacted soils within the salvaged areas? And finally, how might we design treatments to maximize the sediment saving benefits that you found mm -hmm. while minimizing yeah. the loss of soil nutrients. That's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's great though. Um, in terms of the, in, in terms of the slides that you were, you were looking at and um, um, that, that slash treatment on those sites, um, for the most part, the, the results from that, that component of the study um, there, there was nothing done strategically. It was, okay, what it was really operational, whatever fell during the operation as trees came down and branches broke off and, and really the, the materials that were left behind were left in place. The, the next stage to that, which really gets to the, the, the key part of Jason's question were the questions that we had. If, if we actually strategically approach this, are there, are there things that, that we could do? Um, and so we un have undertook the, the, the next, the next um, level of this where we worked with uh, folks from CAL FIRE and US Forest Service and went to different hill slopes and left some as they were like, like you're seeing in the photo at the bottom. And then we took others where we actively removed that material. We took others where we, we hand placed material. We took others that we drove equipment over and, and compacted that further into the ground to stay in place. And 
uh, what was our other treatment? Oh, and another we put, we actually went to the, the effort of putting water bars mid slope. And then we ran a whole bunch of simulations to see which of those might be most effective if we had a overland flow rainfall type simulator at mitigating the erosion. And, and similarly with the nutrients, we, and we took the, the nutrient pieces. That, that work is still um, not worked up in a place where I feel comfortable to, to know exactly what the results are. We, we just did that. Um, the last summer, and so we have all that data in the works, and we'll we'll be able to answer those questions. And it's a, a great question to know operationally: are there actually things that, that we might be able to do? Okay. Um, so we are right up against four o'clock. Uh, sure. So if you would all join me in thanking uh, Kevin Bladen for Thanks. a fantastic talk on this topic. We've had a lot of interest this year. Um, as noted, we, as usual, have our uh, hour-long discussion. Uh, and ongoing questions uh, in, I've copied over the, the questions that folks put in the Q&A and we'll continue hitting at those um, in the discussion section. The link for that is in the chat box right now. Um, it's also in the email reminder you get for this seminar series. Uh, so please go ahead and switch over to the uh, discussion and thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And we'll see you next week. And uh, Kevin, you can go ahead and I'm going to stop Thank recording. You.